Support for LAist comes from HBO, presenting The White Lotus. The social satire returns for a second season to follow the exploits of guests and employees at an exclusive Sicilian resort. Created, written, and directed by Mike White, and starring Jennifer Coolidge, F. Murray Abraham, Michael Imperioli, and Aubrey Plaza. Decider called the series a resounding triumph. Emmy eligible for outstanding drama series and all other categories. At the end of this podcast, you can hear comments from Jennifer Coolidge and Haley Lou Richardson about season two. How to LA is supported by Peerspace, the website where you can find and book cool and unique spaces. Find a space for your next memorable event on Peerspace, whether you're planning a photo shoot or hosting a milestone birthday party. And we want to hook you up. Enjoy 10% off your next booking at join.peerspace.com slash how to LA. LAist Studios. All righty, y'all. I'm pretty sure you've seen the tweets and the social media posts, but we were hit with some surprising and upsetting layoffs at LAS this week. So many media organizations have gone through this lately, and it really says a lot about the current landscape of the media, the economy, and the role of journalism in our culture. You can get more details about the layoffs and restructuring at LAS.com. These are all important topics we're going to get into in the coming weeks. But for now, we're bringing you something fun because, frankly, we all need it. This is a throwback episode from January. We sat down with author and activist Christopher Carter at a soul food staple in Inglewood. Here's the episode. Get ready to be hungry and learn some history. There's something about growing up under such immense suffering and oppression that allows us to survive, and it's manifested in this food. It's a way for people who have migrated in the first great migration, particularly up to the Northeast, to feel like home. Please don't take offense to this if this is how you identify yourself. I don't like using the term foodie. So it has a gentrifying nature to the way in which we think about food, right? I'll go to this place, I wanna taste it, I I wanna say I experienced it, but I don't really wanna know about all the stuff that goes into the preparation and the familial aspect of eating. Like eating is more than just the food that's on your plate, right? It is about the institution, it's about the community, it's about the storytelling. If you're not interested in learning about that or participating in and learning about why a place like this exists, it doesn't really do anything that substantively like not only reshape how you think about food, it doesn't really help the community. This is How to LA. I'm Brian De Los Santos. All right, y'all. When you think of soul food, you probably think Louisiana, Chambalaya, collard greens, crawfish, fried chicken, and all that fire cooking in the South. But today, we're here to show you that there's actually a super unique and rich soul food scene right here in LA. It's got a little different kind of flavor to it than other people would have it, but feels kind of like home, like a new home, you know, a West Coast version of this thing. We've got chicken sausage, hotcakes, catfish, and all kinds of spots, mostly in South LA, that really represent our SoCal culture. I believe it is the best chicken sausage, whether to cook or if you want to get them to cook it, it's well worth the wait. One thing to never go wrong with is the chicken sausage burrito. Yeah, breakfast burrito. And yes, y'all know me. We are going to talk about where to go, what to order, and all that good stuff you know we love here. But what we really want to explore is the origins of this epic cuisine and how it plays a huge role in preserving black history and culture in this city. You could just be yourself, eat your food, be around your people, and connect. Hello. So we met up with Christopher Carter. Hey, thanks for bringing us here today. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Morning. He's the author of The Spirit of Soul Food and an expert on food and racial justice. I mean, look at, listen to this music, man. Yeah, I, I know. Mean, you know I between the... Okay, I gotta wake up now. Guys. Exactly. <laughs> we met him at an L.A. spot that is very well known in Inglewood. You might have heard it. It's called The Serving Spoon. Now, we're here on a Thursday morning. It's barely 9 a.m. and this place is popping. The music is bumping from the outside speakers, setting up the vibes when you pull up. As you walk in, it feels like everyone knows each other, like one big family gathering. 
We're gonna get cozy here, right, Chris? Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Christopher, Chris, Chris, Christopher. So the owner and purveyor of this restaurant, his family had migrated from the south to Ohio, and he came out from Ohio to here to start a restaurant, and it's become an institution. I mean, it's was it Thursday morning, you know, and it's packed because it's community, though, man. Like all these people here, this is folks like connecting, and it's a space you can feel like safe, and that's not always possible, right? People don't tend to think LA when it comes to Southern cooking. And that got us thinking, what is LA soul food? I think people don't perceive LA as like a place where to get soul food or comfort food. LA's food scene is super unique, right? Because of so much migration from really all over the world. But particularly we're talking about people of color because you have indigenous communities that have been here, right? Latinx communities that are now coming here from other spaces. Black folks that immigrated here in multiple waves and a large, broad Asian population. Particularly if you're a person of color, these communities have had to live together. And so you see these kinds of blends of Korean, Black, and Thai, Mexican. One of the challenges people have when they're talking about soul food in LA, like, oh, what is it? I don't know that I see it. That food way doesn't exist here. It's because it's here, but it's different. Like, it has evolved. It's just the nature of what it means to be around and exposed to so much other culture. I eat so much more Mexican food than I've ever eaten in my life. <laughs> it, you know? It, well, and this, but I've also allowed it to shape how I cook soul food, right? I allowed Indian flavors to shape how I cook soul food now. So I make red beans and rice as a way of connecting with my Louisiana roots. I came out here to go to grad school. We got no money and I really feel isolated from my community. And so food is like such a huge way for me to connect to home. And then as I really learn about flavors and cooking, I start adding in different kinds of, particularly Thai spices, things like cumins and more South Asian flavors, like to my red beans and rice. All right, so LA is super unique. We Angelinos know that, even if no one else wants to admit it. But I kind of want to take it back to the beginning. How did soul food as we know and love it today come to be? It's helpful for us to think about soul food as a anti-racist response to white supremacy. At its core, that's really what it is, right? And so it does have to go back to farther than the Great Migration, but the Great Migration helps us unpack that statement a little bit more. And so you have in the West African slave trade, people that are captured and sold on plantations in part because of their agricultural acumen, right? It's huge that these people are farmers and they're amazing farmers. That's why people want to purchase them because they can actually grow the crops that enslavers want them to grow because Quite honestly, like white colonists didn't know how to do it. And so that's why indigenous communities were the first to be enslaved. And then it was Africans because, for instance, the kind of rice that was cultivated in like the Carolinas is the same kind of rice that's grown in, in the Senegambia region in Africa. And so in the midst of all that, you have both black men and women. When they come over, they hide seeds in their hair and other kinds of things so that there's certain kind of crops that are unique to Africa that end up over here. I'm talking about like watermelon and okra and gourds. Those are unique to Africa that are brought here. What we have is like this combination and this fusion during enslavement of those kinds of West African soupy stews with dark leafy greens with some of the, you know, tomatoes and other kinds of vegetables that are unique to the American continent. And that is more or less soul food, even though it's not called that at that point. It's just that this is like Southern food is born. Okay, we're going to take a moment to be real here. Talking with Christopher, we've come to understand that soul food is a product of some really troubling history, but also of survival for black people in this country. But now, how did soul food, or at least this version of soul food, end up in L.A.? You have the second Great Migration, which is kind of how black folks ended up in Los Angeles. And it's the same kinds of things. It's the same way of preserving culinary and cultural identity in a way to have opportunities to open businesses like this to be able to share that with the broader community because you're dealing with less racism than you dealt with in the South and in the Northeast. Racism, 
but just less racism. And so that is really how you have restaurants like this open and how the ideologies and terms and the essence of soul food really is born as a way to not only preserve cultural identity, but as a way to, to tell our story and our way and to really push back against the claims that our ways of eating and being is unhealthy and uneducated and to claim it as a kind of culinary identity rather than just, just this innate ability that black people have. No, it takes practice, it's skill, it's an art, you know? And, and that's why these restaurants are like packed, you know? Alrighty y'all, now it's time to eat. What is the traditional breakfast you recommend for us to grab today? So what we're known for is our catfish and grits. That's like the number one thing. However, everything here is really pretty good. Like um, our turkey chops are really good. Our pork chops are good. The salmon croquettes, the pancakes, the omelets. Another thing is what's not on the menu. A lot of people come and they're like, you want the cornbread, right? Cornbread is great. However, you ask for your cornbread to be grilled. That's the secret menu specialty. And it is fire. Okay, I want that. Yes. I want that. Yes. You just gave me a good secret menu option. So we'll do that for sure. I don't want any eggs because I don't, I don't need eggs. But just a veggie patty, grits, and uh, yeah, well, and actually, in the cornbread you're coming with. Yeah, yeah, try that too. Wait, 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 wait. Hold up, hold up. Are you a vegan soul food cook? <laughs> Did you get a lot of comments, especially as a black person being vegan? I decided to become vegan uh, because as I learned about the intersecting oppressions of animal agriculture and industrial food production, I decided that I wanted to not be complicit in that kind of oppression, particularly as it harms black people. So that most of the people who work in these factory farms, that do the slaughter, that do the cleaning, that do all the stuff that in our industrial animal agriculture production are people of color. They historically have been black and now it's some black, Latinx, a lot of immigrant workers now. It's in the most horrible condition. My grandpa would tell stories about growing up in Louisiana, being a migrant picker and working in the fields since he was like eight, nine years old. It was backbreaking labor. And I just remember thinking like, man, this sounds like slavery. When he would tell me this stuff when I was like a kid and young adult. So then I moved to California to go to grad school. I'm driving to a conference from LA to San, in San Francisco. I see these factory farms, I see these farmers, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. And I'm immediately brought back to my grandpa. I remember my grandpa's stories and I was like, this same stuff is happening. And I was like, man, I knew in that moment that I was gonna change my diet. I knew in that moment I was probably gonna become a vegan. It took another like eight years. A lot of my thinking of and talking about food and writing about food and activism is both an homage to my grandfather and his work in the fields and my grandmother and her work in the kitchen and keeping their story alive, right? So like, so my grandmother can be proud of the work that I'm doing, and my grandfather can be proud of it too. Because, you know, they're like, lifted us up out of generational poverty. And so I wouldn't have had the opportunity to get a PhD, to be a college professor, to be this author, had it not been for their sacrifice. We'll get more into that after the break. This LAS podcast is supported by Will Gear Theatricum Botanicum, celebrating 50 years of summer repertory theater and educational programs for all ages. A Midsummer Night's Dream returns to the spectacular outdoor main stage this June through October, alongside Macbeth, Queen Margaret's version of Shakespeare's The War of the Roses, and the Pulitzer Prize-nominated play A Perfect Ganesh by five-time Tony Award-winning playwright Terence McNally. Explore and picnic in the gardens before the show. Get tickets at theatricum.com. Hey everyone, I'm Rima Hreis, host of This Is Uncomfortable, a podcast from Marketplace. This season, we explore how secrets can shape our financial lives. We've got stories about the creative lengths people go to pay off student debt, what it's like to become addicted to financial submission, and how easy it can be to get stuck in a vicious cycle. We take a look at how secrets take a toll on our lives and what price some are willing to pay for the truth. Listen to This Is Uncomfortable wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to How to L.A., I'm Brian De Los Santos. All right, folks, this has been a super inspiring conversation with Christopher. 
We talked about so much more and we'll be back with him in future episodes. And this food was legit so good. Shout out to Serving Spoon. And I hope you think about the history and the cultural impact of this food when you do. Like Christopher said, don't just be a foodie. You gotta dig a little deeper and become a food enthusiast. But before we go today, we gotta bring you to one more spot. It's sort of a legend out here in South LA. Hey, so you get here? I get the regular. I get like. What's the regular? We're at Mama's Chicken in Hyde Park. So, is this your first time here? How long you been coming? Um, I've been coming here for probably 15 plus years. So uh, it's been a staple in the community. And I always get chicken sausages. So like today, I just came and got chicken sausage tacos. So it's either the chicken sausage taco or a chicken sausage burger. It's been a centerpiece of the community here for nearly 60 years. They sell, you guessed it chicken sausage, among other LA style soul food, like hotcakes, biscuits, sandwiches, tacos, and red beans and rice. But for me, if I'm gonna come to Mama's Chicken, I'm coming to only get the chicken sausage. This place is always packed. Lines often stretch all the way into the parking lot. And that's because these sausages are so damn good. I just like the fact that word of mouth was the best advertisement that we really had. I don't really have to go and pay a bunch of money to put the word out that we have chicken or turkey sausage because our customers have done the job for us. And that's how we really got started. We take pride in it. This is Karen Whitman, or Mama, as most folks call her. She took over this place more than 30 years ago from the original owners. Like, everyone knows about mamas, you know? How do you feel about that, that pe customers come to you since they were kids, now they have kids of their own, you're like a homegrown L.A. icon, right? So That's what they tell me. I don't want to get a big head or anything. I love people. We watch out for them, and they watch out for us, and it's just a wonderful thing, you know? And so now we get people okay. from everywhere. So one last thing. What is your favorite thing on the menu or something that you want to suggest to someone like come and try this eeny meeny miny mo exactly <laughs> i mean really i should put it to you like this you know it's good because mama made it okay that's been around for 50 something years you know Alrighty y'all, I'm not gonna lie, I'm pretty freaking full after my back-to-back -back soul food breakfast marathon. But I do it all for you guys. This episode of How to LA was produced by Megan Botel. Today we got help from author and professor Christopher Carter. Check out his book, The Spirit of Soul Food, Race, Faith, and Food Justice. By the way, we're gonna be taping a new Cheat Fast Eat segment in Inglewood next week. So hit us up and send us your faves at howtola at scpr.org. All righty, y'all. That's it for today. Catch you next time. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. Support for LAist comes from HBO, presenting The White Lotus, the social satire returns for a second season to follow the exploits of guests and employees at an exclusive Sicilian resort. Here are series stars Jennifer Coolidge, who plays Tanya McCoy, and Haley Lou Richardson, who plays Tanya's assistant, Portia. Well, Tanya, I think she means well. I think she wants to be loved. Yes. And you want that with Greg? <laughs> with anybody. Yes, with, with anyone, not, not just Greg. Our characters are very similar, actually. We both are very self-involved yes. in our own kind of pity yes. and problems. And we aren't self-aware of how we kind of fit into the big picture of life. I think I'm much more self-aware than you. You think Tanya's self-aware? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think when you're older, you can be a narcissist, but still know your incredible limitations. And I think when you're young, you don't even know they exist. I completely agree with that. I think that Portia thinks that she's not the problem, but here she is in Sicily and she's just been told to get lost and basically not be an assistant anymore, but she takes it like the end of the world. That's the thing too about Tanya's version of like help and the things she needs an assistant 
four. I think in the first episode is the only time you really see Portia kind of being an assistant. Like she comes into the resort, like holding, you know, bags and telling the bellman where to put things. But then when you tell me to go to my room, I'm still kind of on call for you, but it's really just a lot of sitting in the other room while you're crying or like standing there. And which characters on the show would Jennifer and Haley most like to travel with? I think I would rather actually go alone than with any of the characters other than Lucia. She's very beautiful. I mean, she actually makes most people's trip better. I want to always go where there's everything is ancient. You know, I want to stay in some really old castle. Haunted. When someone says like, oh my God, Jennifer, we got, we're gonna go to this place. I, you know, we're renting this house and look at, we, we found it on a really cool website or like this. And I'm like, is it old? <laughs> <laughs> because if it's not old and crumbling and cool, I have no interest. Jennifer Coolidge acted in both season one and season two of The White Lotus. What's the difference between them? White Lotus 2 has way more sex. I've asked to come and watch some of it. Um, <laughs> I mean, they said it's a closed set, but I was able to get in. Decider called the series a resounding triumph. Emmy eligible for Outstanding Drama Series and all other categories. The White Lotus is now streaming on HBO. Ma, pa, te presento a mi novia Luna. Hola, mucho gusto. Eric Galindo, co-host of Wild here, and this season I'm going to tell you a fictional love story. The type of story that feels like a movie. It was inspired by my life. The woman I was dating, off and on again for a minute, comes to me and says she wants to move to Milwaukee. You're looking at the newest anchor for YWCC News, baby. I'm going to be the face of Milwaukee's leading news source. It was a road trip adventure across America. I was steeped in love and in one of the most confusing relationships of my life. This is a Southeast LA rom-com. It's the kind of fictional audio drama that forces you to confront parts of yourself. From Alias Studios, listen to Wild Season 2, I Think I'm Falling in Love. Catch the new season on NPR One, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts.